So after that very rich presentation... I'm sorry if it went really fast. You can sing the show tunes now <laughs> if you want. Yeah, Music Man is my favorite, so... Like, We've got... No business, I know, yeah. Yeah. We've got just under 15 minutes for questions, songs. Um, yeah, interpretive dance. Yeah, and I'm here to free body, Bobby from the podium. Yeah. Um, so if you yeah. have questions, now is your opportunity. <laughs> I will dance. You know, I take right. Irish dance, right? So I can do it. I can do it, yes. Hi. And we'll start over here. Hi. Hi. That was a really interesting uh, presentation. Um, you talked about... Uh, film as, uh, archi uh, as uh, artifacts of, yeah, of history, yeah. kind of. Uh, I was wondering what you think about the relationship of film as teaching us culturally, and whether you think law has a similarity to that. Because uh, right. that's sort of what, to compare your emphasis with maybe like the what is marriage emphasis, right. uh, law as a teacher, do you feel that uh, artifacts have the same relationship, or if law has that relationship? I do, yeah, I mean, I think that in some ways, film is more powerful, uh, because I if you read the work of Roland Barthes, he says, mythologies work on us much more powerfully when, we're not, when we don't realize that it's teaching us, whereas the law instructs us very explicitly. So, and I think that's one of the reasons why people who have intuitively wanted to defend the family have focused a lot on juridical and legal discourse, and they haven't really been able to take mastery of the cultural discourse. So I would say that, that film is actually more powerful, and it's, it's a testament to that power that on this particular issue of children and their rights to their mother and father, it's been very difficult for people to unearth or excavate the, the other side of the story which isn't being told, because the side that would naturally defend the traditional family, which is the conservative side, just doesn't seem to have a strong connection to culture they're much more strongly connected to the law. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Question on this side? Yeah. Hi. Um, so it noticed, um, or I noticed like in like your 70s and 80s film selections, yeah. they all seem to talk about um, like, yeah. what's it called, nuclear families having trouble. Yeah. But there are also like a lot of good programs from those eras that also talked about how great the family was. Like it's the true, Cosby the Cosby Show. I know, yeah. <laughs> it was, I was just, yeah, when I rehearsed this, I was like, I know that there's so much I can't, you know, I only have so, so limited time. But yeah, the Cosby Show was, was, how many people were alive and teenagers or above when the Cosby Show came out? Was that not the biggest phenomenon? I think it was like the Cosby Show and um, what was the other one with Kirk Cameron? Growing Pains, those shows, and, and uh, my, the one with Michael J. Fox, I think that those shows really were, in the 1980s, almost like, oh my God, we've had it up to here with hearing how awful the nuclear family is. I want to go home and be, you know, see a mom and a dad with kids, and especially with the Cosby show, it was a black middle class family in Brooklyn, and so um, there was definitely, during the 1980s, this huge resurgence of films that were incredibly positive and affirming um, the, the nuclear family. Um, and then they just kind of, you know, they couldn't sustain it, I guess. You know, the siren song from the deconstructive, the deconstructive impulse was, was too powerful for it. Yeah, yeah, no problem, yeah. Please. Hi, I, just a quick comment and then my question. Uh, I just want to compliment you on your integrity because I think that uh, it must be very difficult for you in your personal situation mm -hmm. to be kind of swimming upstream with your thoughts that seem mm -hmm. to be so counterculture. Right. So I, I want to compliment you on that. Um, the second thing uh, I wanted to ask, so if you're using the films of the 50s, 60s, and 70s as these artifacts, isn't there a danger that these films really represent the microcosm of Hollywood and not the total population of the country? In other words, uh, Hollywood is super privileged, super rich, super uh, indulgent, super yeah. everything. Right. And isn't there a danger that they're not really reflective of the real world? There is a massive danger of that. Um, and I think one of the things that's been hard when people have tried to present counter narratives in Hollywood is you have to play the game to get the movie out there and you have to play to the audience and it's, so it's really hard to know when you're gonna have that breakthrough moment, like what I would call the Brady Bunch, where even though at that moment that TV show kind of conflicted with what the general population and the general viewing market was ready for, it just worked, you know, but it made all these compromises at the same time that then led to other 
problem. So it's a huge problem trying to figure out how do you produce culture in a world where the cultural industries do reflect overwhelmingly the interests of very wealthy people. Um, and that's where I think Michel Foucault was so important because we have to always be critical thinkers. Even as we're making ideology, even as we're producing our own artifacts, we always have to be aware that we're erasing things and that we're overlooking things. And you have to constantly be self-examining in order to do this well. Does that answer your question or, or yeah? Yeah. This slide? Hi. Hey, Dr. Lopez. Hi. I am actually speaking right after you. So, oh, okay. Uh, it, All right. But I, I was really struck by how um, related our topics are. Uh, okay. And I have a question that's going to, this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, I mean, you cited a lot of, uh, um, I guess, you know, the book and uh, some of the movies that, I guess, wear their politics on their sleeve. Yeah. And I guess I wonder in your study of that, history, whether you think um, the kind of obviousness of a political agenda affects the cultural effectiveness and the impact that films have? Because that's, that's my instinct as an artist and an art maker is that, so I wonder if you kind of see that from the perspective of a scholar. You know, it's weird because I, I look at something like, for instance, Birdcage, which just to me, I, I as a cultural critic, the, I loved La Cage aux Folles, the original French movie. I can't stand Birdcage because I feel like it's just one long diatribe against the 1990s religious right. I mean, it's like so ham-fisted in its politics. And I look at that and I say, oh my God, everyone else must be able to see this. Everyone else must, but the strange thing is that you find that people don't see it, that they actually internalize it and they start to view the political indoctrination as part of the entertainment. You know, one of my colleagues um, in the field of cultural criticism once said, it's like moral x lax that people get addicted to going to movies to get some kind of feel-good political message, and then they can't wean themselves off of it, if that makes sense. You know, that's, I, I don't know, I wish that I had a, a, a greater faith in the population at large to deconstruct the films, but I find that they just consistently don't. Yeah, <laughs> so, yes. Hi, I, I just want to say thank you. I don't want to get into too much dialogue, but I wanted to just get to my question, which yeah. was, you mentioned at the end, I really, I liked your idea of Foucault, right. Foucault's, Foucault. yeah. uh, his idea of, of queerness, yeah. but I didn't mm -hmm. fully understand or grasp what you meant by it, and I just wanted to maybe, because you ended with the fact that you wanted us to get back to this queer yeah. identity that he represented or maybe explained us, so maybe if you could talk well, about Well, okay, it. let me just say straight up front, I am from the generation of queer theorists when everybody was saying, you know, you know, queer people should never want to get married because you're imposing this juridical control on us that is designed for straight people, you're taking away our independence. So there's a little bit of that left in me, but I, I would say that Foucault's vision of the queer, of what is queer and what it means to queer something is always, it's based on critical thinking more than it is based on sex. It's not based on what you do with your body, it's based on your constant dedication to deconstructing and not buying it when people try to give you, you know, a full package of ideology, when people try to give you uh, some kind of vision of the world or some kind of argument and it looks too good to be true. Right, And that's the thing that I wish that the queer movement would come back to because there was that energy. And there still is. If you go to a website called Against Equality, this is very far left queer thinkers who deconstruct the argument for marriage, the argument for military inclusion, all of these things because they're still keeping alive that old tradition where to be queer means you question, you criticize, you don't sort of smugly accept an ideology, whether it's from people who are like you or people who are different from you. Yeah. I think you kind of answered it, but does, is that yeah. the role you feel, like to question these things and to bring these, yeah. these things to the surface, is that the role that you feel a lot of um, queer people should take or something like that? I think so. I think that you know, there, there's a need to excavate. I think that right now there is a very powerful gay lobby um, that has a lot of money and they've become very entrenched and they put out a lot of narratives, a lot of statements about the way the world is and they don't they overlook or they obscure or they erase so many realities. And I, I think it's time for us to get back to the point where we go out and find, we have to ask ourselves, what are we overlooking? 
You know, what about all of the people who are still getting infected with HIV? What about the incredibly high rate of domestic violence in same-sex relationships? The fact that the HIV infection rate recently went up among boys 13 to 19. You know, what about that we still have rampant problems with depression, anxiety, eating disorders, everything. And none of that really has been, there's been no dent made in any of that by marriage. Even in places where marriage passed quite a while ago, you know, the figures coming from Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Canada, the problems remain. And I think it's because queer people have to go back to the stage where you're looking for what is it that we overlooked? What is it that we forgot to think about on our rush to this one goal that we have, which we're so obsessed with? Does that make sense or? Okay. Helpful for both perspectives if you had. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So as we move towards yeah. our, t our break at 2.30, I'd ask if we could take two questions short and to the point okay. together and if you could respond to them both and okay. if needed, um, extend the, extend the yeah. response into private discussions at the break if we uh, could wrap up. Okay, yeah. Okay, so your talk seemed to center a lot on parenting and like the, the children, mm -hmm. uh, like you said, being told that you don't have a right to a mother and a father. Right. And I in no way want to like uh, negate what Ryan Anderson said about marriage and parenting being intrinsically connected. But I'm just wondering from your perspective, uh, especially coming from queer theory and talking about the parenting aspect, do you see the possibility for like m marriage without, I mean, do you see, I guess, the right to get married for With, gay without, couples? Without adoption. Without adoption or um, IVF, things like that. Right, I absolutely do. I absolutely do, and I have always supported, and this is gonna alienate a lot of the conservatives in the room, and I'm really sorry, but I've always supported civil unions, and part of that because it became, I was raised by two lesbians, and when my mother died, there was no legal protection for her partner, and I saw her get evicted from the house that we had all been living in, and, um, and I got evicted right along with it. So I, I have always believed there has to be some kind of legal protection for it. I supported marriage for a long time, but the problem is that the, the, the people who have proposed gay marriage have chosen to yoke gay parenting and gay marriage together. After the 2003 decision in Massachusetts, unfortunately, the American Civil Liberties Union came out with a statement saying, from here on in, when we fight for gay marriage, we're fighting for gay parenting. And so that put me in the horrible situation where I have to be against gay marriage because it ultimately means that in order to protect the, relation, the sexual relationship between two adults, you have to shatter the relationship between a child and either his father or his mother. So I do definitely, I've always supported civil unions and if I would be a supporter of gay marriage if in fact that had not happened. But unfortunately that is what happened and I think a lot of the people who I might have disagreed with 10 years ago who kept on warning that gay marriage was the portal to new things, unfortunately those people have proved right. That you, gay marriage became this tidal wave that then swept up children. And so that I always see through the children's perspective. Does that answer your question? Or yeah. I had assured you we'd fit, if your fit in your questions. We will if you could be very brief. And Bobby, right. if you could give the nutshell version of the response you would like to give. Okay, yes, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your response, yeah, um, yeah. Dr. Lopez. Yeah. I was going to ask a similar question to yeah. her, but maybe you could expand on mm -hmm. what you think of the morality of uh, same gender relationships uh -huh. and monogamous long-term relationships among them right. without taking into respect the, uh, the children. children. Like, is yeah. it moral? Is it okay for two same gender people to have yeah. sex and have long-term relationships? I think that's between them and God. We're, look, I, we're all sinners. So, um, and you know, we all work through our issues on our own. I, I'm a firm believer in get people, get government out of people's bedrooms. So, um, uh, I, just, I guess I would say I, I, I don't really have a, an answer to it because I think it's an individual question that every individual has to answer for themselves. I think for some individuals, there are things that matter to them a lot, like their religion or the, they're already in a marriage to a woman you know, it's a man who's already in a marriage to a woman and, and in the context of all those things, they can't really rationalize for themselves having homosexual activity. But I, I that's something that's above my pay grade. Does that make sense? Or yeah. I, you know. Um, and you know, with that, so, and we with want that, to say thank you to yeah. Dr. Lopez. <laughs>